Live Fit Podcast, Episode 88, with yoga and meditation guru, Tiffany Cruikshank. Continued apprenticing with an herbalist and studying holistic health and medicine. And um, I started teaching yoga when I was 16, when I went off to college, because I there weren't any teachers where I was. So in my interactions with people trying to lose weight or trying to feel better, a lot of it are very old, very deep patterns that have been ingrained in us based on, you know, either things that have developed as in our upbringings as a child or the way that we see ourselves in the world around us um, really changes and influences how we make decisions. And, you know, to me, it's not so much about, you know, tying our hands behind our back and not eating these foods or restricting our calories or making us run, you know, five miles every day or whatever it might be, as much as really looking more deeply at what's behind the choices and taking tiny bites and, and just make finding ways to bring, you know, simple things like mindfulness into your daily life. Welcome to the Live Fit Podcast with Glenn Johnson, your resource for all things that contribute to good health. You will hear expert advice and interviews with leading authorities on fitness, food, fat loss, mindset, and the mind-body connection. You will find show notes, articles, and health programs at livefitpodcast.com. Ah, uh, yes, it is time once again for the Live Fit Podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Johnson. Thank you, everybody, for listening. This is episode 88. Today, my special guest is Tiffany Cruikshank. She is a yoga and meditation guru. I will give you her full introduction in just a minute, but first, I wanted to share with you a listener question from Sachin. See, I want to know why children like to eat junk food when they know that they are harmful? Wow, what a great question. Believe it or not, I don't think I've ever been asked that question before. I've had many people ask me why they, or the universal we, like junk food, and they're an adult, and the implication is that they're referring to themselves or other adults. But no one's ever asked me why children like junk food before. That's why I think it's a really great question, because, I don't know, is it, obvious do we just do we all know why children like junk food or is it just something we don't relate with because we are generally adults that uh think about these things kids just don't care about it so it doesn't enter our radar but i think it's a great question and i think we should really break it down so here's what i have there's three different categories why kids children like to eat junk food one it's fun two it tastes good. Three, they are short. No, excuse me. They are short-sighted. So let me back up to one. It's fun. Most junk food is fun in some way. It comes with a toy. It's bright colored. It uh, is fun shapes. Dinosaurs are your favorite character. Um, these bright colors are very attractive. Remember, we're hardwired to like these bright colors. It, it attracts us. Fruit, for example, strawberries and grapes and peaches. These are all bright colors in nature that attract us to it. Fruit is not ripe and ideal to eat for very long, maybe, maybe a month at the very most. So our ancestors had to eat as much as they could when it was ripe because it's gone for the next 11 months. So we are kind of hardwired to like that. Now look at the food that's targeted for children primarily candy skittles and m&ms cereal go down the cereal aisle it's crazy in this country it, it it dumbfounds me every time i go down there how many different junky colorful fruity cartoony cereals they are all in the name of fun very little nutrition involved now the second one is it tastes good junk food generally tastes good at least for those people who are used to eating junk food and by taste good it generally has some quantity of sweetness to it some quality of sweetness to it often very very sweet like pop tarts and breakfast cereals and candy and ice cream and frogurt but other things not so sweet still have that blood sugar raising components such as the starch from french fries the starch from uh, other types of starchy foods white breads things like that so it, it generally tastes good, but mostly because it's sweet. Now, the third element that causes children to like junk food is the fact that they just don't care. They've been around, they've been alive on this, on this world for 
three to five to six to 10, 15, maybe even 18, 20 years, they can't see past their nose. They've been, when you've been alive for five years, one year is a really, really long time. So picturing their health at the age of 50 is literally impossible. They don't see the cause and effect. They haven't experienced the cause and effect. They have not yet had a bad blood panel reading. They have not yet felt what it feels like to have a sugar hangover. Maybe they've eaten too much sugar at a holiday like Halloween. Then they feel a little bit sick and they go to sleep and they wake up and everything's just fine. Children's bodies are very resilient. So because they don't have these consequences, they don't really feel that there are consequences. But the problem is they're setting or the parents are setting them up for having problems later in life. Because once you develop that sweet tooth, it's very hard to break it. It's very hard to find satisfaction in foods that are not sweet. Now, what can you do about it? Well, I've broken this down into four elements or four tips that you can do. The first is do not keep it in the house. Number two, have the children make their own foods, junk food primarily. Three, teach them why junk food is bad for them. And four, lead by example. All right, let me give you some more details. For the first one, don't keep junk food in the house. This is what seems like a no brainer, but I've heard so many people say, well, I only have it here for the kids, or I have it here for my husband or my wife or, or whoever the person might be. Look, nobody needs to have that stuff readily available. I, if we're talking about store-bought cookies or candy or bags of sugar, well, or frozen pizza, whatever it might be, you just don't need to have it that convenient. You don't need to have it easy and convenient. It's easy enough to drive up to the store or down the street or even to the next town to a store to get it if you really, really want it. But keep wholesome, healthy foods in your house. And when you're hungry and you don't want to go driving anywhere for your fix of junk food, you're going to eat the healthy stuff. So keep the healthy stuff available, the unhealthy stuff not. Number two, have them make their own. Now, this is great with any kind of food, not just junk food. My kids love these little cooking food preparation competitions where they'll gather and they'll ask us what ingredients they want and we'll say banana and uh, bran and yogurt and they'll put together some sort of concoction that involves those three to five ingredients that we say and you know it's not always very good but what they're doing is they're experimenting with how foods and flavors work together what they like what they don't like and they're having fun with food when they're sometimes they don't even eat it sometimes they just taste it or give it to me and i and i taste it and this is okay you can have fun with food but the idea is not to have fun by eating mass quantities or eating super super sweet things um, i also like to have them make their own meals they're more involved they have a stake in it they will enjoy eating healthy food when they help to prepare it when they have a say children are pretty powerless most of the time so when you give them the power to add salt not add salt to do this to do that they enjoy it more also when you tell them not to do something you know they've been they've been told what not to do forever and so pretty much goes right out the ear but when they experiment and see what a food tastes like when it has too much salt in it boom they remember that and they won't add too much salt next time number three teach them why junk food is bad for them this is something that's ongoing just whenever you get a chance don't sit down and have one big lecture but as you're eating a food say this food is good for you because of these vitamins these other nutrients the fiber the color something like that here's an easy way to tell what foods are good for you here's an easy way to tell what foods are bad for you deep fried brown high sugar things like that Teach them every chance you get. It doesn't have to be a long thing. Just say, oh, I love blueberries. They're so healthy. Another thing you can do is listen to podcast episode 30 of the Live Fit podcast. This is called The Sugar Battle. My wife and I get on and we talk about how prevalent sugar is and how many sugar pushers there are in the world, friends and grandparents and shoot, even yourself. You can also watch the movies Fed Up 
sugar-coated or food ink. All right, the fourth way to help children not eat junk food and discourage them from even liking it is to lead by example. You can speak until you're blue in the face and kids will generally not listen or learn from you, but if they see you eating a certain way, they will mimic it. They will model what you do. So whenever you're around them, at least whenever you're around them, eat healthy food. You don't have to make a big deal about it, like, hey, look at me, I'm eating healthy food. But show them, hey, I just love spinach and tell them why you love it. Maybe they won't join you right then, but they probably will eventually. Show them that you really enjoy this stuff. Go out to restaurants and order the good healthy foods. Most of the time, you don't always have to, but when you don't say, look, I realize I'm eating junk food now, but this is one time in the last two weeks that I've eaten some bad food. I know I am, I know why it's bad for me, I really wanted it, and boom. And then when you're done with it, tell them, oh, I'm really satisfied, or I shouldn't have had that. Even though I wanted it, I shouldn't have had that because I feel like crap right now. I feel like laying down and going to sleep. All right. Well, Sachin, thank you very much for your question. I think it was a mouthful. I appreciate it. And if anybody else has a question, I have a way you can leave your audio message at livefitpodcast.com. You can also email me at glenn at livefitlean.com. If you value this show, it's entertaining or helpful to your health, please show your support by giving a dollar a show. It's certainly worth a dollar, right? That's not even a cup of coffee. A dollar an episode. You can easily do this by clicking on a link on the livefitpodcast.com website or going to patreon.com slash livefitpodcast. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. All right, now I want to get on with my guest, Tiffany Crookshank. She's an internationally renowned yoga instructor, educator, and health and wellness expert. She specializes in combined benefits of Western anatomy and physiology with the ancient Eastern tradition of yoga and the power of yoga as medicine. Tiffany travels the world training instructors and students in topics including yoga and meditation, holistic medicine, sports injuries and rehabilitation, physical and mental health, and yoga for fertility. She has two books out. Her latest book is called Meditate Your Weight. She's going to talk about her book in just a little bit. So let's get on with my interview with Tiffany Crookshank. Hi, Tiffany. How are you doing today? Great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm up in Portland, Oregon. Where are you located? I'm just nearby. I'm in Seattle. Oh, fantastic. So we're having about the same weather. It's not <laughs> yeah. really quite summer weather, but with the rain we're having, it's it's. Uh, I don't mind it being 65, 70 degrees. So pretty yeah. nice. Pretty nice out. Good way, to, good way to spend it, saving a lot of money on air conditioning. <laughs> yeah. I brought you on the call today on this interview because you are a renowned yoga instructor, educator, and health and wellness expert. And you wrote a book about yoga as medicine. And I'm really interested in hearing about that. But before we go into the details of this, I I and the listeners would really like to know how you got from point A to point whatever letter we're on right now. So how did you get into what you're doing and and write a book about the subject that you're about to tell us about. <laughs> yeah, I actually, um, it actually started when I was really young. I was actually a troublemaker and my parents sent me on a, a wilderness program and it really was a big turning point for me learning how to survive. But also I, I met an herbalist who would take me out on plant walks and teach me how to use plants, um, for different types of medicine and, um, it really intrigued me. And so from then on, I, I always had an interest in, in health and healing. I um, did my, I hurried up and finished my um, high school and went off to college when I was 16 and continued apprenticing with an herbalist and studying holistic health and medicine. And um, I started teaching yoga when I was 16, when I went off to college because I, there weren't any teachers where I was. So, um, and I really wanted to share that. And um, didn't realize I'd be doing it the rest of my life, <laughs> but, um, uh-huh. I, um, went on and, and did my pre-med. Um, and then I went on to Chinese medicine school and went on to specialize in sports medicine. Um, and, you know, have always really been interested in 
you know, for me, the Chinese medicine is, is just this beautiful interweaving of the art of health and healthy living. And, um, so for me, you know, the yoga, the meditation, the holistic living kind of all go together. And it's, it's just been something that was, you know, really empowering to me as a, as a teenager and kind of learning to, to help others and has, um, just been really interesting. There's so much to study. You know, I think always the beauty of holistic medicine is, you know, you're, you're constantly refining your health. And, um, mm-hmm. to me, yoga is really that awareness of, of really looking at your body and, and having this body awareness that, um, you know, that for me has been really helpful working with patients as well as kind of giving them some body awareness so that, you know, for me, holistic health is about taking ownership of your body. So it's, you know, the, the first step to that really is just having some body awareness. So for me, the yoga really is a natural part of holistic medicine um, and such an integral part of it and meditation as well. Right, right. You know, it's funny. I, I teach uh, several health classes and I have uh, I'm a personal trainer as well. And one of the things I, I recall or kind of noticed in my life was this shift from or to taking ownership of your own body and your own health from where it was where your doctor told you what to do and your doctor was God and your doctor had your <laughs> health in his hands. And so you, if you didn't feel well, you go to the doctor. You know, like the old joke about take two aspirin, call me in the morning. So someone goes in there with a headache and says, gee, I'm in pain. I don't know what to do. And they see their doctor and he says, take an aspirin. And, you know, that's a bit of an extreme example. But it, it there's definitely <laughs> been this shift just in my lifetime from – your health being in somebody else's hands to now it being in your own. And I think a big part of that is the internet, that the information is available. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was just about to say the same thing. I think, you know, I didn't have internet, you know, in high school and college, it was kind of just coming in to play when at the end or during my college at some point. And, um, you know, I think the internet has really changed a lot, which is, I think is pros and cons, right. you know, I think, we can learn so much from the internet and I think it definitely has helped people become really proactive in their health, which is, um, as a healthcare practitioner standpoint, I think is really helpful to have people come in and want to be proactive. Um, you know, but also recognizing that, you know, you only see a small part of it on the internet. You don't, you don't get the bigger picture. So working with, with professionals, with healthcare professionals is really important. True. And it, it takes a, an educated brain um, with some experience to kind of decipher what you're really looking at because I could yeah. I could read all kinds of symptoms for a variety of things and find some that match <laughs> me it's kind of like a horoscope well yeah that kind of works okay sure I believe it and it always ends up back at cancer right oh, like yeah. <laughs> well, it must be cancer <laughs> oh absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've I definitely have cancer I mean I've got We're this pain in my knuckle it must be cancer <laughs> Yeah. And I think that's why it's really, it's like, I always say like, you don't know what you don't know until you know it. Right, <laughs> so it's hard. Right. You know, we learn these bits and I always, you know, I, I spend a lot of my time training yoga teachers. And so a lot of it is constantly reminding them, like, we don't know it all, you know, as a yoga teacher, we don't know it all. We have to continue to really work with, with doctors and healthcare providers is, is such an important thing. You know, we, we are as a society becoming so empowered by the internet it's so incredible. It's really helpful. Um, but also recognizing, you know, that, that there's, um, you know, limitation to that too. Yeah. And you know, I, I love what you said that we don't know at all and it's, it's great. And I, and I'm assuming that you probably say that to your, to your clients that, Hey, I don't know everything and I'm learning and I can still learn things. I know this, but there's other stuff I still need to know. Am I correct? Absolutely. I mean, 20 years into, teaching yoga and over a dozen years into seeing patients. Um, I, I don't know that I'll ever stop learning more. And, you know, even nowadays we know so much, even a specialist, you know, in medicine, everyone specializes now. Gosh, those, those general practitioners, <laughs> those poor general practitioners, cause gosh, there's so much to know, even as a specialist, you know, you, you can't even know all of your, your own field. Right. Anyway, oh yeah. How much yeah. You know. that, there's, there's a lot to know. And each specialist has such a, a depth of knowledge and, and th- there's been a few times where they've said, I don't know to me <laughs> and I was asking them a question <laughs> that you would think they would know cause it was within their scope and you know, I'm not at all disparaging. It's just that there's a vast quantity of knowledge. And plus there at some point, if, if it's not something you use very often, then it kind of disappears to make yeah. room for new stuff. 
And I don't know about you, but for me, when someone says that to me, I honestly have more respect for them. Yes. Because I feel like, you know, as healthcare providers, we have this tendency to want to help with everything. And I think it's so important to be able to recognize those limitations and refer people out. Or my my partner came back recently from a, a consult for a, a bicep tear where the, you know, it was very small and the doctor was like, well, we can detach your bicep up here and move it over here. And he was like, Hey, I'm, I'm like, I'm functional here. (laughs) (laughs) So it's, you know, I think when people are like, Hey, you know, I don't, I don't really know. Let's try some things. You know, for me, it's always an interactive process, you know, with whether it's my students, patients or teachers, you know, it's like, we're going to work, we're going to work on this together and see what happens, you know? So as a, as a, you know, as a, inhabitor of your own body, <laughs> you know, you, you kind of have to be able to take that ownership and, and know that you're going to need help along the way. And, you know, some doctors will help you. And then at some point you might need to go and find someone else. And, you know, just to be proactive in the journey, I think healthcare really is a journey and a learning process for people. You know, part of it is learning things on the internet and reading and, 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 uh, looking for good sources there on the internet and, Part of it is working with and finding the right healthcare provider, which, you know, I think is really probably one of the biggest limitations of our healthcare system is this lack of integration and networking, um, which is which is changing. Mm-hmm. I like to think. Yeah, it, yeah, it definitely <laughs> is changing, and I see a uh, a lot more holistic and functional medicine physicians out there, which I I love, and and it, it's too bad most insurance companies don't recognize them, but I think as as demand increases their value, then they will. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm a, I'm a big fan as well. So I think there's so much that's changing. Like even in the yoga world, we're, we're starting like very, very seldom, but we're starting to see some insurance policies covering yoga, uh, mostly private policies, company policies and things. Um, acupuncture's caught on so much more and things are changing. I mean, if you had told me 15 or 20 years ago that we would be where we are now, I wouldn't have believed you. Really? <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely not. Yeah. And, and, and as far as like how popular things like yoga and meditation are, that absolutely wouldn't have believed you. Huh. Um, I, so I think it's great. I mean, it's incredible to see this wellness movement really making such a big, a big shift. Yes. Yes, it is. So, so tell me what inspired your book? Just this, just this knowledge and that there, there was a, an open niche. Yeah. So, well, my first book was really, um, kind of something I was using with, with, uh, my patients one-on-one quite a bit. I was doing a lot of kind of optimal health programs. I would set people up on these programs that they would, you know, I had some meditation, some yoga, nutrition, um, to help them shift either whether that was body weight or health issues, Um, and I was doing a lot of that one-on-one and eventually I started doing it as workshops and I did that every year around new year's and one year it was so thick, all the handouts I gave them (laughs) by the end. I (laughs) laughed, I left, this is going to be a book next year. And and then I was like, wait a minute, maybe it should be. And so the first book kind of evolved naturally on its own. Um, and then the second book was a follow-up to that. So, you know, I found that there's, there's so much information online now and, um, you know, a lot of people are, are doing all the, you know, the right things and, and eating well. And, you know, there's always things we can do to kind of tweak for our, our individual body and our individual kind of needs. Um, but for me, one of the big missing links was this, was this meditation component, this meditation component that, was so to me really vital for changing the nervous system and the mind and, and really kind of shifting the body on a bigger, more kind of global in your, in your body, global, um, system wide shift. Um, and for me, for the people that I was seeing, a a lot of the people I was seeing were people who were exercising and, and eating pretty well and really not getting the changes either mentally or physically that they were looking for. And, um, I found in my own experience, just adding in even just five or 10 minutes a day of meditation really, really helped, especially since for most people, stress is such a huge component in their lives. And, and, you know, we now, we now know that it's such a huge component in our health too. So, so that was the book. That was where the book came from. Now, is that the primary, uh, 
kind of motive of the book is is meditation and de-stressing, and that will allow people to uh, reduce their stress, which will allow weight to either not be stored or maybe even come off. It's it's actually a lot of things. So it's it's called meditate your weight. So it is it's mostly for around weight loss. But I find there's a lot of people who do it because. I'm a yoga teacher. There are a lot of students of mine who do it who aren't looking for weight loss necessarily. Um, but it, it, the first part of it talks about the science behind it of things like the cortisol response and the stress response. But there's also this really other com- really key component <clears throat> I find, which is you know our relationship with food, our relationship with our body, our body image, how we choose foods, and you know, how we see the world around us and how we kind of make choices based on that. And so a lot of it is also just that mental perspective. Um, in my interactions with people trying to lose weight or trying to feel better, a lot of it are very old, very deep um, patterns that have been ingrained in us based on, you know, either things that have developed as, in our upbringings as a child or the way that we see ourselves in the world around us um, really changes and influences how we make decisions. And, you know, to me, it's not so much about, you know, tying our hands behind our back and not eating these foods or restricting our calories or making us run, you know, five miles every day or whatever it might be, um, mm-hmm. as much as really looking more deeply at what's behind the choices and, um, and, and, not necessarily that I always need to make the right choices, but to look at why I make those choices so that I can decide, you know, do I really need the sugar today or am I just kind of craving a little bit of sweetness in my life? Maybe some fun or some, maybe I'm lonely. Maybe I need to get out of the house. Um, maybe I just didn't eat. (laughs) Right, right, right. And so your, your hunger response is, Hmm, candy or chocolate or whatever. And you know, what I've found is oftentimes people go for something decadent when they're simply dehydrated. They, they need a little water. Absolutely. And there's, there's so many reasons and that's why it's so hard. I think you've probably experienced this too. The more you learn, the more, the harder it is to give someone just an easy answer to some, why do I have sugar cravings? Like, how do I, how do I fix this? How do I fix that? And so for me, the meditation, you know, is almost like an owner's manual to your unique body. It's not a right or wrong or a a right way to do things or a right diet as much as noticing how your body responds to things, noticing having this deeper body awareness to, to not always have to choose the right foods, but to notice why you're choosing them. You know, I, I think you need to have moderation. Everyone needs to be able to indulge a little from time to time. I think that's healthy. Um, but you know, obviously every day has its, or even really often has its effects True. and and there's time and a place for, you know, obviously more extreme things, but, um, but yeah, for me, it's really just looking at the mindset behind it as a way to create more really slow, but long-term changes that people can really stick with rather than the drastic, let's shave off 10 pounds in a week (laughs) scenario. Yeah. And, which comes back and it's 15 pounds then. <laughs> I know. And that's something that I've been pushing for quite a while is is the whole mindset of the thing. You you wrapped it all up in a nice little uh, nutshell there and, you know, the meditation and, and starting with the brain. It's not, you know, you can count calories forever and maybe you can even lose weight that way, but it's not forever. It won't last forever. And <laughs> it's this whole yo-yo dieting and you, you simply can't be forced into it. You have to be able to eat intuitively. And to do that, you have to be in touch with your body. Do you want water or do you want chocolate? Do you, you know, need some protein or calcium or do you need some other component of this food that you're craving? And being in touch with your body helps you understand what it is you really want. And meditation is certainly a really excellent, excellent way to to get there. In fact, um, the combination yoga and meditation, I can't think of any better way to become better involved and in contact with the real needs of your body. Absolutely. And I think it's it's so crucial for so many things. Um, I was I started the acupuncture program and the yoga I uh, did a bunch of yoga at the Nike um, World Headquarters in Portland actually. Uh-huh. I was there for about six years running that and um, worked with a bunch of athletes and you know people also who work there who are pretty proactive in their health and you know so I think for me also even working with athletes people who are you know looking to really push their bodies to the brink 
or people who are looking to lose weight or people who are just looking to feel better or have better memory or moods. Um, to me, the, the meditation and the mindfulness is such a, it's kind of like the foundation. It's like the starting, well, okay, well, I have to know what's happening first before I can start to change. So, um, yeah, for me, it's just a really crucial part of it. So, so what's your, your meditation technique that you recommend for newbies? I mean, for me, the biggest thing about meditation, you know, is that it, it just needs to be something simple that you can stick to. You know, we, we understand now this, uh, this concept of neuroplasticity, this idea that the, the brain and the nervous system can rewire based on really the things that we do over and over and over, but it needs to be done repetitively. So in order to change patterns or shift, you know, our awareness, whether that's changing eating habits or um, sitting down and being able to meditate and be mindful of, of what's happening in our bodies, it really, the frequency is, is the most important thing. Um, so there's so many different styles out there and they all are great, I think, in their own different way. Um, but the biggest thing I think is finding a time and a place that you can commit to. Um, in my book, I have people just start with three minutes a day. Oh. Um, and it doesn't have to be a lot. They've actually done a lot of studies and they've shown that people can get benefits just from a few minutes a day that last for weeks afterwards. It's, I mean, it's incredible. They, I mean, granted the studies do show that the people who are, have been practicing for longer periods of time are, you know, getting in quotes, more benefits. Right. So it is a cumulative effect, but it, it doesn't necessarily need to be that you're sitting for an hour or even 20 minutes finding five or 10 minutes every day. I, I think the beginning of the day is the most important mm -hmm. um, because, you know, for me at least, once I get going, it's like everything, you know, you get busy and you lose track of things. Um, so I like morning, but just sitting, the easiest way to do it that I've found um, is just having people count their breath. So the key to this is that when you're sitting and meditating, one of the kind of universal themes you'll see in meditation practices is this idea of being an observer. So that as I'm watching the breath, um, I'm not trying to change it. I'm, I'm not trying to judge it or fix it or it's not needing to be a certain way, but I'm, I'm literally just observing and watching. Again, kind of the baseline to body awareness and, you know, just noticing the sensations in the body. Um, so this counting is a really simple tool to just keep you focused on that experience. And, and what it is, is just counting each exhale. So I exhale and that's one, the next exhale is two and I just count to 10 and then I start over. Okay. And if you're lost or you end up at 20, it really doesn't matter. So if you think about this, like an exercise, you're, you're, you're building up this muscle, this, the mindfulness muscle is what I call right. it. Um, and it's just like going to the gym, you know, if you go once, it'll do a little bit, but it's, it's training it. So what you think of is every time your mind wanders off, it's the bringing it back that strengthens that muscle, not that you have to go to 10 every time. Oh, I see. Interesting. So it's really not about perfection. It's just about coming back. Progress. Yeah. You know, I've been trying to become a regular meditator for uh, 20 years or so, and uh, obviously by what I'm saying right now, you can tell that I, I have not, quote unquote, been successful. I'm still very interested <laughs> in it. I still uh, totally believe in it every time I do it. I, well, let's put it this way. I've never once been sorry that I that I spent, you know, three to 10, even 20 minutes doing it, never once. Um, but it, it just really hasn't um, kind of ingrained into my habit. Do you have any recommendations for people like that? Yeah, I mean, I think for most people, that's the hardest part. And so I do think that having having the short period for most people, you know, they tend to think more is better. So they, oh, I need to do 10 minutes or 20 minutes every day. And I actually prefer people start small so that they can really stick with it. So even if three minutes doesn't sound like very long, just starting with that to make it a routine, picking a time of day, you know, I really find first thing in the morning is the easiest, um, before you turn on your computer and get sucked into everything. I just, I keep my meditation cushion next to my bed and just, you know, wake up enough to be alert. You don't want to fall asleep while you're meditating, but I'm up long enough to be awake and, and kind of roll over and meditate and have it first thing in the morning. It's a great way to start your day, I think. And you know, who can't commit to, to three minutes? It is hard. I agree. And, and you know, there's days, you know, where you might skip it, but the majority of the time, you know, just being able to find the time to commit to that at the beginning, I think, and make it a routine is, is 
the biggest part, most people start to feel like, um, with the book and with my experience, people start to feel the effects more in just how they feel in their day and really more of like what I call the happiness factor, <laughs> um, rather than the weight loss. The weight loss does take time if, if you're looking at very specific physical benefits, but if you can stick to it for a while, most people really enjoy it. Um, but yeah, it is definitely something you just kind of have to commit to. There are some really great apps um, on, on, you know, on the phones now, one, mm -hmm. one that I really like is called the mindfulness app. Uh -huh. Um, and it's nice because it will, um, send you little reminders through the day. Like, you know, it might randomly send you a message that says, notice the sensations in your feet right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's really nice too, because again, you're bringing those, that mindfulness into your day. It also has a little counter so that, you know, when you sit down to meditate, you can set it for three minutes and you don't have to worry about, you know, missing your, missing your schedule or, um, whatever's next in your day. Um, and I think there are some, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if you can do it on that one, but you know, you can set, um, alarms in your calendar so that it reminds you in the morning. Um, any of those can be great. I mean, really it kind of is up to the individual to find something that works for them. Some people like to create a little routine around it, have a little, you know, place they go and sit at, have a alarm in their phone. Mm -hmm. But to make it a ritual of some sort that's accessible, that's accessible that you can do, you know, if you travel a lot wherever you are, but also attainable, something that is really easy right. to stick. To. You know, I have a question about the morning one. I've I've heard that before, but to me, it seems like um, well, I just woke up and I, I'm already fully rested and haven't tackled the day <laughs> yet. How how is it beneficial first thing in the morning? Well, and, and there's, there's a lot of different ways that meditation can be used. I think for me, the first thing in the morning is it kind of sets that precedent for the day. I, I don't know about you, but for me, if I, you know, in the morning, I, I start to get on my emails, I start to get on my phone, my brain starts racing, I'm all over the place, you know, pretty quickly, mm -hmm. you know, we tap into our days and, and we're off in five different directions at once. Um, so it's a nice way, I think, to prepare and, and you know, what we see, we have this idea in our brains that our bodies kind of thrive on multitasking, but the reality is our bodies don't really do well on multitasking. Our brain and our nervous system really isn't made to function in that way. In fact, we're very much more efficient when we can focus on the one thing and really be in it. And this, you know, this is meditation. This is that presence that coming back to the breath, um, that we were training in the meditation is, you know, to be able to really be present in what we're doing to be more efficient. So, you know, I think of it like setting the precedent for the day to be more efficient or, you know, to wake up if it's more, if your meditation practice is more about, you know, health or weight loss, um, is to wake up and, and just notice how you're feeling that day so that, you know, whether you're an athlete or, um, someone who works from home or an office or takes care of their family, you might make small shifts during their day, your day to notice, you know, I am really tired today or I am feeling this way today so that, you know, there are small things. It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, many of us can't just all of a sudden shift our schedule and be like, I'm tired today. I'm not going <laughs> to work. Right, right. Um, but there are small ways that we can kind of gauge our energy output and, and just little shifts in how we approach the day. Right. Um, you know, one thing I have found that works really well for me, and I've been pretty consistent about it when I can, is um, I I drive around kind of a lot. So from day to day, I, I drive from place to place. And what I like to do is arrive at my destination and take, you know, as long as I have the time, take uh, five to ten minutes and just do a little meditation in my car. And I found that really helps kind of separate the past from the future and so it 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 uh, prepares me for what i'm about to do who i'm about to talk to that sort of thing absolutely and you know the great thing about meditation is you can do it anytime you know i like the morning just because for myself personally i will put it off later on because my day gets really full and then even those five minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes whatever it might be seems like i can't let them go right. so for me personally i prefer the morning but Absolutely. I have um, students and patients who will set like an alarm on their phone and do it midway through the day. Sometimes if people especially are, are working on kind of mental efficiency and cognitive memory, um, things like that, it can be really helpful to do midpoint in the day. And the great thing about the meditation that I explained, the 10 count meditation is you can do it anywhere. You don't even have to close your eyes. You could do it while you're driving. You need to obviously pay attention to what you're doing while you're driving. So it's not 
you know, it's a little bit different, but you can get kind of the gist of it there. You mm-hmm. can do it at the end of the day, maybe to de-stress at the end of your day. If you have, especially if maybe you have trouble sleeping as a way to kind of unwind into your day. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can use it. You really can use it anytime. But like I said, if you're really trying to use it for the long-term benefits, whether that's on your metabolism or cognitive function, memory, whatever, happiness factor, um, the, the regularity is the importance. So, mm. you know, trying to do it most days for a few minutes um, is going to be the most important on a, you know, neurologically. Okay, good, good, fantastic. Thanks for that. Um, so your book is Meditation for, no, Meditate Your Weight. Yeah. And where can people find it? Um, it's all over. It's on Amazon. It's in Barnes & Noble. It's on my website on yogamedicine.com. Um and yeah. your other book is Optimal Health for a Vibrant Life? Yes, and absolutely. Ava- and the same. Available in those locations as well? Yeah. Okay, I'll have links to your books and your website on the show, um, on the show notes page at livefitpodcast.com. Is there anything else you'd like to say to my listeners? Yeah, I mean, I think the ending thought would just be that, you know, the simple things that you can do on a daily basis, even just in a moment's time to – Notice your body. Notice the sensations. Um, the simple things I think that we do more regularly are really going to be the things that have, a, in, in my experience, a really powerful effect on our health in a, in a long-term way. So, you know, don't get overloaded by making having to make huge overhauls, although those can be very helpful as well. Um, mm-hmm. Taking tiny bites and, and just make finding ways to bring you know simple things like mindfulness into your daily life good bring mindfulness into your daily life i like it all right thank you very much tiffany it's been a pleasure speaking with you i i'm really thrilled about your book and i will definitely recommend it to uh, people who can use it well thank you it's been a pleasure to be on the show thanks for having me my pleasure have a good one you too bye thank you for listening to this episode of the live fit podcast Please subscribe and share with someone you care about. Read show notes, articles, resources, and learn more about our weight management programs at livefitpodcast.com. Once again, thanks for listening and always remember to live fit.